Dr. Stephen Lieb is the renowned American economist and financial author. He has been following the silver market for decades. This is what he says. I mean, as we all know, it started with Silicon Valley Bank. And very easy to call that a one-off. Uh, after all, they, they cater to the tech companies. Tech companies have been doing absolutely terribly. And uh, they also cater to a coterie of very wealthy depositors. And that combination was characterized as basically one-off. I mean, you know, who caters to tech and wealthy uh, uh, depositors. And the, the significance of wealthy depositors is that they follow what's going on in the bank. And if they see a hint of trouble, they're out of there. And that what that was the initial claim. Don't worry, it's one-off, it happens. I mean, whatever. Uh, not so much with Republic. And when I start doing a little research, because I am writing 10th book, my last, to find out what's going on. And the first thing that shows up in America right now is there are very few wealthy depositors. The bottom 50%, and I, I kept looking at this chart where they have this little part of the chart that indicates the bottom 50%. Why is it so small? Because they don't have any savings. The 40th to 90th percentile have savings, but they save maybe 5% and going down. All the savings in this country of any magnitude is of very wealthy investors, exactly the same kind of investors that took their money out of Silicon Valley Bank. This is not one off. This is like all off. I mean, this is a time to be exceedingly worried uh, on so many scores. And, um, you know, at a certain point, obviously, they're going to say, well, what bank can I put my money into? Maybe JP Morgan. And that would be fine if they haven't listened to your, uh, uh, it, yeah, your program, Andy, which I have to say had me, if I'm tired today, it's because I was thinking about that. You're telling us that there are two quadrillion dollars in derivatives out there. Now, I, I believe that actually. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. I mean, when you leverage on leverage, I mean, it doesn't take too long before you get to these gargantuan numbers. Well, that's enough to take anybody under. And Andy, I mean, I, I think the world owes you a, a lot of gratitude for pointing out to us that our banks have never really been uh, straight arrows. I mean, it's been a long time since we could really count on our financial system to give us very good advice or be representative or be on our side. I mean, the financial system in this country is on the side of the financial system. And one thing I find very tragic and one thing one thing that led me to led me to gold. I think I'm a good person to have on, not because I know so much or anything like that, because I was a person that grew up in what I would call Jeffersonian democracy, which defined America and um, you know equality of opportunity, uh, e equality before the law, equality this, equality that, and I grew up with an America that was. Pro I, I've never read about an America that was as good as our America was. And things started going sour in this country because in 1971, that's literally, you can even mark the date, 1971. What happened in 1971? Well, Andy, I mean, if anyone knows what happened in 1971, you do, and so do all your listeners. But I probably didn't at the time I was asking the question, but I sure do now. 1971 was when we went off the gold standard. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. And translating that, cutting through a lot of the chase, etc., that meant we were free to spend as much money as we wanted for anything we wanted to. That's what it translated. Basically, that destroyed the country, going off the gold standard. That's what I've come to realize. And it has started slowly and began to accelerate when China joined the War, uh, World Trade Organization in 2000. And until China had draw, uh, joined the trade organization, 
Basically, the rich West, not to their credit, had done absolutely nothing for the developing world. There were no differences in growth. I mean, the developing world was flatlined as far as improvement. But China drew, uh, joined, and basically their thesis was, was basically Jeffersonian. The SCO is as close as you can come to Jeffersonian democracy. If you read, I tell, what I tell people right now, if you want to see where I'm at, just read the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. And I, I know that's not a good topic for you guys, I mean, because you're British. But, you know, one thing I'll point out in that is uh, in the first paragraph, it says explicitly, we, we don't want to be better than Britain. We just want to be on the same playing field. And we're not because our rights are not being respected. And they, they say the rights that were given to us by the creator with the creator capitalized, implying no specific God. It could be creator, could be a, a universal consciousness, etc. I mean, they, Jefferson, one quick anecdote about Jefferson, which I think everyone should appreciate. John Kennedy, uh, when he was president, had a gathering of uh, a lot of Nobel Prize winners, other major intellects, and they were all having dinner in this one room in the White House. And Kennedy got up there. He had a pretty good sense of humor. And I, I don't know whether he really meant this humorously or not, but he said to the gathering out there, this is the most intelligent group of people we have ever had in this room since Jefferson ate here alone. And that basically says a lot about the people that founded this country. And we more or less, not in a perfect fashion, far from it. We made a lot of mistakes, a lot of terrible things we did. But by and large, I would say until 1970, we more or less followed uh, a very good path. When I was growing up, everybody was pulling the same oar in the same direction. Uh, the, the, the chairman of a major company like General Motors maybe made 20 times more money than his workers. I mean, that's a big difference, admittedly, but it's still not enough to say he's a different religion. He lives on a different sphere. I mean, 20 times, yes, he can afford a much bigger house, a nicer car, but basically, he he could not afford things that were essential that we could not afford. I mean, everybody had what was equal to the sense that almost everybody could afford what was essential in life. That's not even true anymore. I mean, it really isn't. I hate to say that. And that has been changing ever since and now at an accelerated pace. And if you're free, like a, like a child in a candy store, which is what America became when they no longer had to back up their uh, currency with anything. It wasn't backed up with anything other than oil, which everyone needed. And, you know, I don't want to get into that. I'm sure you know the history of that. We were like children in a candy store. We created these massive uh, uh, um, structures. We, connect, we created a financial colossus and no longer was everybody pulling in the same direction. Now, if I can just go to the 90s as an example of why I'm, I'm so crazy about gold and why I have problems, you know, recommending physical gold because I that's the only thing I believe in right now. Well, no, change that, physical silver as well. Physical silver and physical gold and also gold miners. I mean, I, I think that that's a good thing because whatever happens, we're going to want more, more gold. I mean, it, it, period. But if you want the gold itself, it makes no sense unless you have allocated gold. I have bad news for you. If you're not rich by now, you're screwed. And if you're in debt, you're even double screwed. How so, you might wonder. Well, the sad truth is that you're working your whole life to make someone else rich. The mega corporations, the banks, the politicians, everyone is getting richer. They get your money. And what is even worse, they get your time. They get your life. You are not even in a rat race. You're in a financial prison. But what could a solution for you look like? Honestly, I don't know, but I know what a solution for me would look like. It's very simple. I use whatever money I have 
and I multiplied with 1000. This could make my life much easier and probably yours as well. If you have $1,000 available and multiply this with 1000, I believe that this could solve some financial issue for the one or the other. Of course, if you're ugly, you would have to multiply it with much more than 1000. My name is Marco Stan, and this is what I decided to do. I decided to 1000x my money. This is not a joke. I know what you may be thinking. You know, what, what, what is this guy talking about? You, how should this work? This is not possible. Well, I made a detailed video where I laid out my plan. And some clever folks might even want to look at this plan and copy it and do exactly what I do. This is just a little hint on the side. You have two options. You leave, you forget what you have seen. You do whatever you're doing and you hope that somehow you get some other results. Good luck with that. Or you click the link below the video. You enter your email address because I'm not showing this to everybody. You at least watch my video on how I plan to 1000x my money. The choice is yours. Make the right choice. Join me. See what a different future you could have. See at least how I intend, how I plan to do the 1000x. So click on the link below, enter your email address and I see you on the other side. Your Marco Stan.